And I have dealt with issues as part of my work on agriculture, both uh, looking at the, the larger economy of agriculture, uh, as well as as part of my work in in villages, uh, field-based work in villages across the country. I have had a chance to look at, uh, uh, in particular, uh, uh, look at economy from the perspective of farmers, uh, much less from the perspective of traders. But uh, uh, so I thought, uh, let me see what I can say. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, just making some general points about to try and put the whole question of agricultural markets and agricultural marketing, agricultural prices in a larger context. And I think that's important because agriculture is a, is a production system. And I feel that somewhere, particularly in recent debates, uh, in particular related to agricultural prices and agricultural marketing, uh, this this is often forgotten. We often tend to talk about uh, questions related to agricultural markets as if it's something that can fix the problem of agrarian crisis, as if it's something that uh, can be dealt with in isolation with rest of the sort of larger agrarian question. And I think that is counterproductive. Uh, I feel particularly strongly about this because I think not only are the governments uh, uh, victims of this problem, I think even among the movements, even among the farmers' movements, increasingly uh, in their process of trying to sharpen their demands, uh, they seem to be losing the focus. Uh, they seem to be losing the point that a lot of these things are part of larger strategy for agricultural development, and unless they are seen as part of larger strategy, uh, you sometimes uh, uh, are actually making demands, making uh, uh, decisions which are not particularly correct. Uh, I think it's so. So uh, I think it's it's important to sort of situate the whole question of agriculture markets and, and agricultural prices in that larger context. Uh, historically, if you look at the post-green revolution period, in fact, agricultural markets and policies related to agriculture markets and agricultural pri prices were really central pieces of the system of uh, uh, planning, in particular planning for agricultural development. But in, in a larger sort of uh, framework of planning, agricultural marketing was part of that whole uh, sort of uh, context. Uh, these were central not only to the strategy for agricultural growth and for achieving uh, food self-sufficiency. These policies were also a crucial instrument to ensure that food was available to growing non-agricultural population. The policymakers were mindful of the fact that these were perhaps the most powerful determinants of cropping pattern changes, for example, sometimes desirable, sometimes undesirable, uh, that were taking place. That prices were not only a way of improve, providing economic incentives to producers, but were also crucial determinants of food inflation. And that with all the inequality in access to land, food inflation was a problem not just for urban population, but also actually for a large majority of rural population. So you know, uh, you when you talked about agricultural pro policy uh, pr prices, when you talked about agricultural marketing, you thought of these as as something that actually had repercussions on all kinds of aspects of uh, the agrarian economy, and not just about one or the other thing. Uh, now, uh, so that's one, and I think this is something that is quite central to the problem we face today. You see, when we talk of agrarian crisis, even the, the farmers' movements today, you know, uh, spell out their demands in terms of, for example, wanting to have an MSP, which is 1.5 times uh, uh, cost of production. Now, you know, what's, uh, how can you only talk of this? You see, this is a problem. The, the, when you talk about agricultural prices and agricultural marketing as the crucial core policy issues, divorced from larger 
context of agrarian policies, you tend to fall into this trap where you are basically demanding that MSP should be 1.5 times the cost of production without considering what cost of production itself is. Now, the point is that if you look at the, the post-liberalization period, you basically find that economic reforms policies, you know, withdrawal of uh, uh, state in terms of uh, providing subsidies, making investments, have first and foremost had an impact in terms of raising the cost of production. I mean, uh, that's been the, the, the most important, in some ways, the, uh, the phenomenon. Uh, the impact of economic reforms in terms of uh, withdrawing specific kinds of regulations. Uh, we were looking at uh, data, for example, on fertilizers. You know, the whole uh, deregulation of uh, uh, non-urea fertilizers results in a huge rise in cost of fertilizers, which has a direct bearing on cost of production. Okay. Similarly, uh, you know, uh, uh, stagnation of state investment in irrigation has resulted in a situation where irrigation is increasingly privatized. In irrigation is increasingly done through private tubules, which has had a direct bearing on the cost of irrigation going up. Now, all of these things have meant that the cost of production has risen. Now, if one doesn't look at output prices in that context and merely poses the question as, as returns to farmers not being sufficient over and above the cost of production, you're actually missing a major point. So I think it's important for us to when we ask the questions about agriculture marketing, when we look at agriculture markets, when we look at agricultural prices, to actually situate them in the larger agrarian context. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I think narrowing down the demand and the problems or to one or two, two key things is, is actually rather problematic. Now, in this case, the problems are of multiple kinds. Now, one is to talk about uh, output prices being 1.5 times cost of production. As I said, is is problematic because cost of production has been rising. So you are not talking about why the cost of production is rising. You are merely saying whatever the cost of production, uh, state should ensure 1.5 times uh, th that being being received by farmers as prices. Now, you are, two, you are posing it as a as a formulation where it's 1.5 times, 50% of cost of production, irrespective of what the crop is. Now, when you say 50% on top of cost of production, you're, you're saying 50% uh, over, over and above cost of production for sugarcane, and 50% over cost of production for, say, urat. I mean, the cost of production is sort of, one's talking of, uh, you know, difference in terms of times of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a huge difference in cost of production. Now, now, if there is a huge difference in cost of production, then one, I mean, somebody who's growing sugar cane gets a huge profit if he gets 1.5 times cost of production, while somebody growing urat gets peanuts. I mean, that doesn't even get urat for 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 if the person's given 1.5 times cost of production. So that's not actually a great formulation, even in that respect. Quite apart from the fact that. Uh, cost of production itself has been inflated. The third thing is that, I mean, we've not really thought about what it means in terms of food inflation. Now, if you have a larger structural problem of land distribution being so highly unequal that a large majority of your rural population either does not have land or has tiny amounts of land, you actually have a situation where bulk of your rural population today for its livelihood depends on either wage labor, wage labor in agriculture, or wage labor outside agriculture. In fact, increasingly wage labor outside agriculture, which means that the problem of a substantial part of even your rural population being dependent on food purchases has actually even increased. Now, in that situation, higher food prices would run, I mean, high, higher uh, wholesale prices of food would also translate in higher consumer prices of food. And, you know, we've not really thought about implications of that. So, I mean, I think the whole, 
the the point i want to make is that the questions of uh, agriculture markets and questions of agricultural price policy have to be situated in the larger context and unless that that is done we are, we are actually going to compound our problems rather than solve them uh, the second point i want to make is that there is been a lot, i mean i think we keep rediscovering the wheel you know i mean these are things that uh, i thought were well known to the generation at least two generations before me so uh, the fact that we are still talking about them is shows that we keep forgetting basic lessons there is a large body of literature that talked about imperfections in agricultural markets interlocking with credits and input input markets penetration of traders and merchant capital in the system of agricultural production and extension of land monopoly and landlordism into monopoly control over agricultural markets uh, professor sen talked about the whole sort of problem of agricultural mandis as an institution which has uh, which has uh, sort of refused to get reformed let's say you know i mean for all the talk of reforming apmc act you know nothing really very much has happened because of the sort of hold that merchants and in some cases landlords have on these agricultural markets now i think there are two things to be understood here one is that the let's you see the whole motive of having apmc act was to you know let's say even if somewhat ineffective was to regulate agricultural trade because agricultural trade was where you saw the sort of the the worst of uh, uh, the the agrarian relations the worst of uh, agrarian power being concentrated and and the whole motive of regulating agricultural markets was to somehow say that okay if there are merchants who are giving dadon or who are giving advances to traders and uh, sort of engaging in unfair practices to 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 control farmers in particular uh, sort of extract surplus from poor peasants state has to intervene to regulate agricultural markets now uh, not well state has not that has not been very effectively done sure there are serious problems with with uh, i mean let's say ineffectiveness of uh, apmc act in doing so but you can't be talking about throwing the baby with the bath water so now you're basically saying that let's not regulate let's get rid of AP apmc act let's deregulate agricultural markets now the point is that this problem of imperfection of agricultural markets has remained as in fact one thing that has happened with coming in of regulated mandis has been that at some level this has got somewhat consolidated uh, i'll give you one example we did a survey in a village in madhya pradesh in 2010 uh in in a village in gwalior where the landlord was a very interesting person i i always give this example in my class on agriculture and he's really the 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 classic uh, landlord as one would like to know uh he had some 200 bigas of land the best lands of the village you know close to the close to the road you know the entire stretch of land was his and uh, he was the uh, sort of quasi judicial authority in the village he used to take pride in the fact that never once had a police complaint been filed from the village because he was there to resolve all disputes in the village when he walked around on the streets people had to touch his feet and 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 so on but what was interesting was that he was the he had been chairman of the local mandi he was he owned an adat so he was the commission agent uh, his son owned a, a dalia mill a wheat processing mill and one son owned a, a poha mill where, where the rice is is processed so he used to be the main buyer of all produce from the village he used to be the commission agent his sons would basically process the wheat and the rice that he bought and he was the chairman of the mandi now it, it was very interesting to see how the power gets concentrated now uh, you see the commission agents charged uh, i think 3% those days from the farmers for giving them 
payment upfront. So when the farmer goes to sell the produce, uh, the commission agent organizes the sale, and the commission agent recovers the money from the buyer in future, but basically makes the payment to the farmer upfront, and for doing that, charges something like 3% as a commission for, 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 for doing this. Except that in this case, Babu Singh was the buyer, Babu Singh was the commission agent, and Babu Singh was actually pocketing that 3%. And, and all of the grain that he bought went to his son's uh, factories for, for turning into Dalia and Poa, and so on. So you see, that's the nature of concentration that can exist. This, of course, takes different forms in different parts of the country. There are in Eastern India, where you don't have a market yard, so to say, you could have a situation where the traders are dispersed. Traders are of different kinds. In a place like Bengal, you could have you know, small traders who buy things from the village, then sell it to a whole hierarchy of traders, eventually uh, the, the grain reaching either in Calcutta or Bhubaneswar or wherever. Uh, or a place like Punjab, where a particular community, Banyas, for example, have had traditionally a hold on the mandis. But there has been a, there have been periods where the large uh, sort of landlords have tried to move into it. There are these whole sort of market barriers of, of you know uh, entry barriers into the mandis. But you know this has been a tussle. While uh, the artis have been the major creditors for poor peasants, you know, lending money to poor peasants not just for agriculture but sometimes for all kinds of things. I remember in. 2005, when I did a survey in 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 Fatehabad, and the 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 commission artis basically ran the whole economy. So you could, if your daughter was getting married, you went to the arti. The arti gave you slips for buying clothes. The arti gave you slips for buying jewelry, for buying all the various things that you needed for the for the wedding and for the dowry, and everything was just credited to your account. So that was one side of the relationship the commission agents had. And the other was that uh, the large landlords actually put their money, sort of they sort of invested in the business of commission agents. So although the landlords could not themselves, even where landlords could not themselves directly enter into the market as merchants and commission agents, they were actually putting their money. They were saving their money with commission agents who were giving them a return and were doing the sublending. So you know it's a, it's a it's a complex network of relationships highly concentrated and where the concentration of power is critically though in different ways linked to concentration of ownership and control over land and the production process now this is a critical aspect of agricultural markets in India and something that, as Professor Sen was saying, has refused to go away. You know, all the reforms that you've done have actually meant very little in terms of change precisely because this, this uh, sort of control and power that was concentrated in the agricultural markets is not, uh, there's nothing has been done to sort of break that monopoly. Uh, so that's, that's another thing that I think is, is a crucial aspect of agrarian agricultural markets that needs to be discussed and uh, seen how uh, in the context of agrarian crisis, what happens to that concentration of power, how that concentration of power sort of plays out uh, in a situation of agrarian crisis. One thing that we know about agrarian crisis is that agrarian crisis is always differential. In a situation, in a context like India, it's never a uniform agrarian crisis that affects equally all classes. I mean, an, an agrarian crisis is in fact a boon for somebody. I mean, if, if there is a crisis, if there's a drought, if there's a flood, there's a money lender who benefits from it. So what happens in situations of agrarian crisis, how does this concentration of power and wealth play out is something that we need to, we need to discuss. Now, uh, I would, uh, uh, sort of briefly like to you know uh, present a few things from a study we did two years back on the global economy of pulses where we looked at uh, agricultural markets and there were a couple of things that i thought were were useful there for for me to flag we looked at cost and returns from pulse production in different parts of the world and uh, this graph here is for chana, the, the top panel, then masoor, and then the, the beans, the rajma, 
uh, beans. Uh, and what we've done is the, the first column is countries where you have large scale producers. And the next column is countries where you have small scale producers. The rows are not comparable. Essentially, what we've done is for each country, we convert the costs and output in terms of kilograms of that crop. So if you look at the first crop, uh, let's say first row, let's say in Australia, the total value of output per hectare is 1,200 kilograms of chana. OK, that's your per hectare production is 1,200 kilograms of chana, of which something like 600 kilograms goes towards the cost. And 600 is the return that a farmer gets. Okay. Similarly, every bar is in terms of that crop. So in, in India, for example, the chana is about a, uh, 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 one uh, metric ton, of which about 700 goes in cost, and 300 is what a farmer saves. So if you convert the cost also in terms of the, the using the price for that crop into the quantity of the crop, you basically get out of the grain that the farmer produces, how much is actually saved in, as, as return of the farmer. Now, there are two points that I would like to show. I'll show you some sort of detailed numbers in a moment. But you know, there are two things that one needs to see. One is that every country which has large scale production has higher returns. I mean, Australia, Australia and Canada for lentil, for uh, uh, North Dakota, United States for common bean. The, returns are higher than they are in countries which have small peasant production. Uh, the second thing is that these returns are higher not just because their yields are higher, that is the total length of the bar is taller, but also because in most cases their cost of production is lower. They are actually producing at lower cost than we are. Uh, these are variable costs, they don't take into account capital costs, but this uh, stands out very strongly that that their cost of production is lower. There is a third element. I'll come to that in a moment. But let's look at the details. Now, this is for uh, lentil, that is masoor. If you compare India, Bangladesh, Australia, and Canada, okay, I mean Canada's production is twice that of the other three countries. Okay, the the uh, the variable cost. If you look at the cost, the Canadian costs are are somewhat uh, are, well are considerably lower than. So Bangladesh, the cost is 721 kilograms of lentil go towards the cost. In, in Canada, only 339. So the costs are lower. Now, interestingly, costs are lower, uh, most importantly, because uh, look at the labor and machinery costs. They're spending less, not only on labor, but also on machinery. The machinery cost in India and Bangladesh is much higher than machinery cost per hectare in Canada. And you would think that large scale production will be more mechanized. But here, our farmers are spending much more even on machines, leave aside human labor. Now, what is interesting is that they've actually moved to much greater cost of chemicals. I mean, you have, uh, you have, uh, look at Australia, 199 uh, kilograms of, of uh, lentil go towards cost of plant protection chemicals and inoculants. One big transformation that has happened in large scale uh, uh, production in developed countries is a shift towards uh, use of herbicides and a shift towards no-till cultivation, which has meant that machine costs are lower. Farmers are basically killing the, the, the stubble and the, and the weeds by use of herbicides. So the chemical costs are higher. It's, in fact, chemicalized agriculture is much more a characterization of this agriculture than mechanized agriculture. I mean, in fact, we are perhaps more mechanized than they are. They are just using chemicals and killing the weed. And, and in fact, planting next crop without uh, tilling at all. So, so you actually have a situation where machinery is used more efficiently, uh, tilling is not done, and is replaced by use of chemicals, resulting in a situation where their cost of production is considerably lower than us. This is something that's seen across the crops. I've got here, for example, chickpea, chana. In case of chana, look at Australia. I mean, Australia produces 1,300 kilograms of chana per hectare. Myanmar produces 900. We produce 1,000. Okay. Look at uh, variable costs. They spend 563. We six, spend 660. Okay. So, if you look at 
our costs are higher, our yields are lower, and per hectare returns are hugely lower. Now, there is something more here. So this is one problem, that when you are competing, when a country with small-scale peasant production is competing with a country where production happens on large farms, you have so you already have two problems. One, the yields are much higher. There is much greater application of modern uh, technology, better seeds, better uh, application of technology. Uh, you have lower costs, again, because of better use of technology. But you have another problem, and I think that's even more serious, which is that an average, a median farmer in Canada has 600 hectares of land. This level of return over 600 he hectare of land for a family farm in Canada means a huge annual profit. At this rate of return, even if you had the same rate of return as a Canadian farmer, a, an Indian farmer with something like uh, half a hectare of land actually is going to make an absolute earning, which is starvation income. You see, so now that simply means that if you're talking of, say, 10% return over production, or even 50% return over production, 50% uh, return over production in case of lentil production in Canada means that lentil is a booming business in Canada. Lentil is not only a booming business in Canada, lentil has become more profitable than wheat in Canada. Okay, Chana is more profitable than wheat production in Australia. Okay, it's unthinkable in India that lentil or chana would be more profitable than wheat. Okay? Now, you actually have a situation where 50% return over production means that it's a booming economy of Canada, while 50% return over cost of production in India, given the small scale of production, means that farmers are starving. Now, this results in a situation where the small, I mean, there's just no way you can compete. There is no competition between a poor peasant of India with a large-scale produ producer of Canada or Australia. Now, this needs to be understood. E now, you see, and this is a problem that's compounded because of three things. Because of lower yields, because of higher costs, and because of small scale of production. These three things together is a killer combination. Now, if you actually had a situation where you had had RC RCEP, I mean, Indian pulse production would have been destroyed. I mean, at least Chana production would be destroyed. You see? So you actually have a situation where agricultural trade, when it's opened up like this, I mean, the, between countries with small-scale producers and between countries with large-scale production, there is just no competition. I mean, to, to say that we're going to have a level playing field is, 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 is really a... Uh, a scandal on, on, on working people of the country. So that's, that's my second point. Now, looking at pulses, there are two other things that uh, sort of stood out. One was we did a bit of an analysis on futures market for Chana in India, which uh, there were essentially two points that stood out. One was that in the period when we had futures market in Chana, the volatility in spot market increased because of volatility in the future market. So, so volatility, rather than bringing down volatility in spot markets, the futures market contributed to increasing the volatility in the spot market. The second thing was that it was clear that, that uh, futures market was not a place for farmers to hedge their risk. You know, I mean, not only were the farmers not actually able to function in the markets, the risks were higher in the future market than in the in the spot market, and you, it was not as if these that was a venue that was an avenue where farmers could hedge their risk. The third thing that stood out was, uh, you know, if you look at value chains between the developing countries and developed countries. And you know, we, we are looking at commodities where value chains are extremely important. I mean, pulses have to be milled, pulses have to be processed before they are consumed, particularly in India they are. They are milled and India is the biggest market. Uh, it is clear that Indian value chains are much longer than value chains in developed countries. You have a whole sort of hierarchy of traders and uh, commodities sort of uh, 
pass through that whole long value chains, which means that the cost of the difference in the value, the, the price that a consumer pays and the difference that uh, in and the price that the producer gets is pretty large. And that further squeezes out your producer. So you've got actually a, a series of things that squeeze out your producers. You have small scale of production, you have higher cost, you have low yields, and you have, you have long value chains. So all of this essentially means that your farmers are squeezed that much. So this very clearly creates a situation where you simply, there's no possibility of competition between uh, uh, po poor peasant economies and, and economies with large scale production. And, and to me, there's no, I mean, there is no choice but to but to have ways to protect your peasantry. There's just no other way of doing it. Uh, now coming uh, to my last thing, which is about the agricultural policies in the current regime. I think, uh, I mean, I don't know. I was, I was thinking of, you know, Marx saying history repeats itself first as, as trage tragedy, then as farce. Here we have a situation where tragedy and farce are actually happening together. Now, I don't know uh, what is uh, what to worry about. I mean, if you look at agricultural markets, the only thing that the government is interested in is e mandis period. That's the only thing they want to uh, talk about. You, I I once went and met uh, uh, Joint Secretary in the ministry, and the only thing he wanted to talk about was Imandis. And for him, the only authentic source of data on agricultural prices was real-time data coming from Imandis. Now, what does one say to this? I mean, and he said, you know, I don't want to look at this AgMarkNet data, which is daily price data from hundreds of mandis across the country, because the only thing that I'm, I'm the, 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 where the future lies are price data, which are real-time coming from mandis. Now, from from e mandis. Now, what what does one say to this? You know, where, I, you, I mean, you you actually have a situation where policymakers are so completely divorced from the reality. I mean, the fact that the trade in the actual trade in e mandis, you know, what is not just being cooked up and shown as trade in e mandis, but actual trade in e mandis is not even the point one percent of total trade, is of no relevance to to your 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 policy makers is uh, is what is worrying you know not only the fact that your policy is completely misdirected but the fact that you've shut your eyes to to the world and you've shut your eyes to the reality is what where the problems lie in fact it's it's not even clear whether this is simply because of their ineptitude or it's actually a clever design. We were, Prachi is here, Prachi and I were, uh, we were uh, doing some work on fertilizers and we decided to visit some fertilizer traders to find out uh, what had happened in the wake of GST. So there's been a whole, is my time over? I'll just take a, I'll just take a minute, I'm just, my last thing. Uh, you know, this whole thing of, uh, uh, GST being imposed on fertilizer is supposed to have increased the prices of fertilizer. So how are farmers taking it? It was quite interesting to talk to the fertilizer traders and they said it's not a problem. And we were quite surprised why it was not a problem. It turns out that you see this, in since you've had a situation of deregulated fertilizer prices, fertilizer prices fluctuate every day. It just changes every day. Now in between, GST also came and got introduced and farmers obviously didn't realize whether it was just one of those fluctuations that was coming in or it was an additional tax that they were paying. So the additional cost of uh, fertilizer co price because of GST simply got absorbed because the fertilizer pr pr prices are now fluctuating from one day to the next. And no farmer knows what actually the real price is. And you go to the market and there's a new price, you pay the price and you buy the fertilizer. Now, you actually have a situation where Agricultural policies are changing so fast. Things are coming in, and we are really in ill-equipped to deal with it. You know, in terms of resistance, you are not able to build the resistance simply because there's so much happening, and I mean, so much is being dismantled that where do you fight is is is, is really a question. So I think let me stop here, and then we can take some questions. Thanks.